after his talk, you'll never think the same way about Jesus nor about math. Welcome to the Green Circle, Dr. Laubacher. So math and Jesus, that's a bit weird, right? You might be thinking these two things don't quite mix, kind of like water and oil. But I'm here tonight to maybe try to convince you that math and Jesus is actually more like peanut butter and jelly. So you might actually be sitting there thinking, maybe you do see the connection between math and Jesus. Right? After all, Jesus was raised by St. Joseph, who is historically known to be a carpenter. That's math in a way. Oddly enough, this talk has nothing to do with carpentry. I'll explain. First, let's imagine ourselves on a beach. And in your hands, you're going to be holding a sand bucket, the kind you would use to build a sandcastle with. But we're not actually going to be building a sandcastle. Instead, we're going to go for a walk, a long walk, a long walk on the beach. OK, so this is what we're going to do. Before we embark on this walk, you're going to look down the beach, and as far as your eyes can see, this is where it gets hard, as far as your eyes can see, you can imagine that there's going to be infinitely many sand buckets, each filled with infinitely many seashells. So it's our job to go on this walk, and every time we get to a sand bucket, we're going to stop, reach in, grab a seashell, and put it in our own bucket. Then you walk to the next one, stop, reach in, grab a seashell, put it in your own bucket. Do this forever. And at the end of the day, your own sand bucket is filled. Everyone with me? All right, great. What you just did is an advanced mathematical concept called the axiom of choice. Now, you might have heard this word axiom before, maybe from high school geometry or something. In the math world, an axiom isn't something that we prove or disprove. Instead, we either choose to accept it or reject it. So as for the axiom of choice, I accept it. In fact, there's not too much advanced math that we can do without it. So if somehow that got you excited, you nerds can talk to me in the lobby afterwards. But in its essence, what the axiom of choice is saying is, every time we get to a sand bucket, the choice of the seashell exists. It doesn't tell us how to make the choice. It just tells us that we have one. The choice exists. Right? In fact, funnily enough, mathematicians care a lot about existence. A joke might help. So here's a joke for everyone. Imagine that you have a mathematician a chemist and a physis physicist all in a house, and it catches fire, right? Imagine the panic, right? Everyone jumps into action. The chemist runs to the kitchen and starts measuring out exactly how much water they're going to need to put out this fire. The physicist sits there on the couch and starts calculating how best to throw the water onto the fire. And then they look around, and they see that the mathematician's gone. Right, so they run around the, the house, and they find that the mathematician went back to sleep. The mathematician went back to bed. So they wake the mathematician up, and they're like, well, we got to go. This house is on fire. The mathematician looks at them calmly and says, the fire exists. Problem solved. <laughs> so so this, this is what mathematicians care about. We care about existence. We care about that the choice of that seashell exists. So what we want to do next, though, is talk about a famous consequence of the axiom of choice. It's called the Bonnach-Tarski paradox. This is, this is uh, some famous work done by two mathematicians from the 1920s. But what it says is this. Imagine that I'm going to give you a bowling ball. Here you go. Very nice of me. And then I smash it. Right? So if you want to exercise your brain a bit, imagine that I smash it into infinitely many pieces. But if you're like me, oh, that sounds a bit gross, maybe just imagine at least five pieces. We can work with five. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the five pieces or more of this broken bowling ball, and as consequence of the axiom of choice, we can rearrange those pieces and get not one but two bowling balls 
identical to the original. Right? This is where you should be impressed, maybe ooh and ah on a bit, yeah? Right? So this is clearly a paradox, because one does not equal two. Right? We're not going to dwell on exactly how this is happening, but just know that it does as consequence of the axiom of choice. But this Bonnach-Tarski paradox is completely mathematically valid, right? But do you see the connection to Jesus, right? Jump to the Gospels, right? Specifically, the Gospel story of Jesus feeding the multitudes, right? So this is where my boy JC has five loaves of bread, two fish, and he feeds 5,000 and still has leftovers, right? So if you're a Catholic like I am, we believe that this actually happened. This is one of his miracles. This isn't an analogy or a parable or any of that. This happened. Right? So how, how does he do it? Right? But does it? So doesn't this sound like the Bonnach-Tarski paradox? Right? So there's Jesus with his bread. That's your bowling ball. He breaks it. Right? Jesus literally breaking bread. Right? Uses the Bonnach-Tarski paradox by way of the axiom of choice. Those are your buckets on the beach. And then gets a second loaf of bread. Does it again and gets another, then another, then another. Feeds everyone. So it's likely that Jesus had some training in carpentry. That makes him a good mathematician for his day. But what makes him deserving of the superlative here, of being the greatest mathematician ever, is that he can do physically what we could only do theoretically. So if you're like me, maybe you've sat there and thought about, you know, who, who is God to me? Like, how can you better relate to God? So maybe, maybe that's why I leave you with it. Who is God to you? As for me, my God is a mathematician, the greatest ever. Well, folks, I think I smell another fire. So I'm going to go back to bed. Thank you.